Every time you're looking at the sky, you're looking back in time. Since light travels at a finite speed, it takes a while for the light from a star to reach our eyes. And so you never look at, at the sky as it is now. You always look at the sky as, as it was then. And that to me is really wonderful because the deeper you look into the universe, the closer to the moment of creation you're looking. The surf was low and the sun was already setting behind his back. Copacabana Beach lay bare in front of him. Here and there, older fishermen tried their luck along the beach, retired men in their 60s and 70s with little to do, their skin leathered from years under the tropical sun. They all knew the persistent 11-year-old who would come three or four times a week to the same spot with devout discipline. The routine was always the same. He would run to the water with the rod behind his back and cast the line as far as he could beyond the breaking surf. Entranced, he shifted his gaze back and forth from the distant horizon to the tip of the rod. He didn't know then why he had to fish, but he knew he did, alone. The most important event that happened during my formative years is that I lost my mother when I was a six-year-old boy. And you know, and when you're six and you lose your mom, life becomes very complicated. There's a prayer that is called the Iskor, which is the remembrance prayer where you have to remember the people you lost. I was eight and I'll go sit in my grandfather's lap, you know, at the synagogue to think about my mother. I'm like, that has to accelerate the way you think about the world and about life and about death. I was very much fascinated by time. Time to me was the biggest mystery. You know, how come somebody's here now and it's not? You know, in a second, you know, what happened? Where does time start? Where does it go? How do we fit into this kind of long narrative of time? I was there to kind of find my place within myself and within this much larger scheme of things, you know, the world. And it allowed me to kind of develop a sense of loneliness that was okay for me to be with myself. And I think this kind of perception was very empowering to me because the life of a, a theoretical physicist, in some ways, is kind of the life of a writer or a poet. You know, you do spend a lot of time alone. When you study uh, the universe, you find out that there is this beautiful dance of life and death that is happening all the time. And the dancers are the stars themselves. You know, they are born and when they die, it turns out that their remains trigger the formation of new stars. And this has been perpetuating itself for almost 14 billion years in the history of the universe. And I find that a beautiful symbol of how the universe is always in transformation and change and in renewal. Two large silvery shadows darted 50 feet away, high on a wave. The boy retrieved his line quickly, hooked some fresh bait, and cast right behind where he had spotted the pair. For 10 minutes, nothing happened. Science is all about learning from failure. As is fishing, I always tell that to my grad students. I said, look, science is about research, research. You search, and you search again, and you search again, and you search again until you actually get to a result which is meaningful to you. And making sure that you are happy, not with the end result of the process, but it's the process itself that makes you happy. Theoretical physicists really deal with what we don't know about nature. You know, you go out there to try to understand something, 
nobody has understood before, to discover a new phenomenon of nature. There is the intellectual challenge, but there is also the joy of being part of this game of discovery. Suddenly, he felt a strong tug. His arms turned rubbery. The boy ran to the water's edge, holding on to the rod with all his might, trying to reel line in. But he could hardly turn the handle. It wasn't a shark, but it was big. Bigger than anything he had ever caught or seen anyone caught at Copacabana Beach. There is something very visceral about discovering something new, something that no one has ever seen before. One of the things that people feel about modern science is that the more that we learn about the universe, the smaller we feel because the universe is so huge and there are so many galaxies and they're all expanding and we are just nothing in this huge vastness. It's quite the opposite because we are the molecular machines that are able to have self-awareness and to understand and to ask all these questions about the universe and our place in it. When you are searching for life in other planets, other worlds, in our solar system, we start to realize how precious Earth actually is. And Earth is this oasis with exploding with life and its diversity. And once you understand that, you start to look at Earth with different eyes. The mission of our generation and the one that follows is to actually preserve life and also our planet with everything that we've got. Because the truth is, the Earth will exist without us, but we cannot exist without the Earth. So as the years went by, I also started to realize that uh, the act of fishing, even though it's very beautiful and elegant, is you are imposing your will on a creature that has nothing to do with you. And I just couldn't live with that. If I wanted to connect to nature, there are many, many other ways. And the way I found was to trail and mountain running. This sort of symbolism that putting your body so viscerally close to nature, that you're running like your ancestors, is to me a way of celebrating how much we are part of this beautiful world that we live in. So much of us humans, so much of our creative impulse is an engagement with what we don't know, with the mystery of love, with the mystery of nature. And so to get to the end of something like knowledge, this quest for knowledge is awful because it will stop us from being who we are. You know, creatures which are mysteriously connected with the unknowables of existence.